Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we are back with another tier list and in today's tier list, I'm continuing the series where I'm ranking some of the best players of this generation at every position. So far, we've done midfielders, strikers, and wingers. If you've not seen those videos, you can go check them out. They're on my page somewhere. But today, as you can tell by the title, we are doing center backs. I am so hyped for this tier list because this generation has some of the best center backs of all time. I mean, look at your screen right now. Look at the pictures on the screen. This list is fucking stocked. I cannot wait to get into this. We're gonna look at a combination of, uh, of longevity, peak, and also trophies won. Not really gonna look at stats because to me, center backs are not obviously valued on how many stats they accumulate, like goals and assists. No one really cares about that because they're not tasked with doing that. Uh, but yeah, man, I'm super excited for this. After this, we have goalkeepers and fullbacks. So again, I'm gonna keep this series going. If you guys like it, so if you do like it, let me know in the comment section. And yeah, man, I'm super hyped for this. As you can see, we have a limit of four on S tier. I should address that, by the way. We have a limit of four players only on S tier. I S tier cannot have more than four players, which is going to be very difficult to do because, like I said, this list is fucking stacked. But we're going to do it anyway because when you have like 10 players on S tier, it devalues the tier. So again, four players on S tier, it's going to be really difficult to do, but we'll make it happen. And yeah, man, um, let's just get into this. I don't, I don't know what else I was going to say. Let's start ranking some center backs. First up is Mats Hummels, who to me is going to fall into B tier. This guy is one of the most underrated center backs of this generation, and his peak is extremely underrated as well. Mats Hummels from like 2011 up until like 2014, 2015, that three or four year window, in my opinion, he was at worst a top seven center back in the world. And I'm saying at worst, because there were some years you could argue he was actually closer to top five. I mean, this guy was that good. And I'm obviously talking about those years when Jurgen Klopp was at Borussia Dortmund and they were winning the Bundesliga back-to-back -back years and making the UCL final. And he was obviously a key part to those teams. And he was the leader of that back line. And then in 2014, the next year, after making the UCL final, he wins the World Cup with Germany and was a key piece to that Germany World Cup winning team. I mean, he wasn't just like a passenger. He was like, obviously, he contributed to that team. He played the whole 120-minute final. He played. He started six out of the seven games that Germany played in that World Cup. So this guy was that good for Germany as well. Arguably the best player in that Germany backline on that World Cup. I know Jerome Boateng, who we're going to talk about very shortly, very shortly here. He was really good as well. But this guy, again, like I said, that four three year window, really, really good. And also, like as a player, really only had only really only has. Sorry, I should say has because he's still playing currently. He's not retired yet. He really only has one weakness, which is his speed. But he makes up for his lack of speed with so many other great attributes. Most notably, his position positioning and also his physicality. I mean, this guy has such a big frame. He's so tall. He's so physical. He would just body and muscle strikers off the ball and his positioning helps make up for that lack of speed because he's always in the right place at the right time and barely ever gets caught lacking. So this guy is really, really good. But the reason why I'm putting him in B tier is because when he went to Bayern Munich, I think his peak kind of faded a little bit. He wasn't really the player that he was. He was at worst, maybe a top 12 center back in the world while at Bayern Munich. And this guy, one more thing about Matt Tomos, barely ever gets injured. I mean, he plays a lot of games. If you go look at his transfer market injury history, he misses like two games here and there like two like he has like small like knick-knack injuries but never really any significant injuries so that's obviously a testament to him and, and how physical and durable he is but to me again I can't put him above B tier because someone's got to go into B tier in this tier list I mean the tier is there so someone's got to be in there and to me Matt Tomos' peak wasn't quite as high as some of the other guys here and also his longevity I understand that he's still playing for Dorman currently but let's be honest he's not even close to a top 10 center back in the world right now he's still serviceable and a good player but not one of the best in the world I don't think his peak is quite there with some of the other guys here also his his uh his longevity while he's been playing for a long time i mean he hasn't sustained that great level for the longest so for that reason he's gonna go into beecher but my tumbles to me I mean, super underrated player and a really, really good center back in his peak. One of the best. Next up, we have Thiago Silva, who to me is going to fall into S tier. And it's weird because Thiago Silva spent the majority of his career at PSG. And obviously, we know that's not a great league. But this guy's longevity and peak is honestly second to none. He's still playing currently and is still arguably a top 10 center back in the Prem. And last year was a top three center back in the Prem. And the year before was a top three center back in the world. I mean, this guy has been that good for that long. And again, at Milan, when he learned from Nesta, he was was amazing and obviously at PSG where he was mostly at his peak he was fantastic went to Chelsea a couple years back got that big move and finally got his hands on that UCL trophy and was after N'Golo Kante arguably Chelsea's best player in that whole UCL run I mean this guy is a Rolls Royce of a defender one of the only few bright spots in that uh, Chelsea team currently, I mean, Thiago Silva, even at, his, even at his advanced age, I think he's like 38 years old. I mean, this this guy still proves that he can play week in and week out. And again, to me, his peak is one of the best I've ever seen. 
Like, even for Brazil in the national team, take away, like, if you, if you don't want to talk about PSG, I mean, this guy in the big UCL games, he showed up for PSG. Even when they were playing other big European competition, this guy always showed up. The team just let him down. But this guy, I remember watching him play. He was always, always so good. And at Brazil, I mean, that 7-1 that happened against Germany, part of that has to do with the fact that Neymar wasn't on that, it wasn't playing that game, but also because Thiago Silva missed that game as well. If Thiago Silva plays that game, I'm not saying Germany don't win. They're going to win 100%, but I don't think they score seven past Brazil. I'm telling you that right now. So this guy to me, and he's also one of the greatest leaders that we've ever seen at that position. I mean, this guy, the way he can command the pitch is second to none. And again, his longevity and his peak. I mean, this guy, go back and watch Pete Thiago Silva. His speed and his strength, so underrated. He's not the tallest guy, but he just has this presence about him on the pitch. And he's just, he's, a, he's an amazing player to me. One of my favorite players of all time, Thiago Silva, because I think people underrate how good this guy is. I think he's honestly one of the best. I think he's a, a top four center back of this generation. Hasn't won, obviously, he won a Copa America, I'm pretty sure, back in 2019. I think he was part of that team. Hasn't won, obviously, a World Cup, but he won a UCL, which is obviously a huge trophy. Uh, and again, was a key part to that team. It was not just like riding the bench. He was a key piece of that team. So for that reason, he's going to go into S tier. I know, bro. Like it's, it, I, 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 I'm trying to save my spots in S tier, but Thiago Silva, to me, no debate about it, has to be in that tier. Next up, we have Diego Godin, who I really debated putting into S tier. I really, it was between him and Thiago Silva, who am I going to put into S tier? And I picked Thiago Silva, but I was this close to putting Diego Godin in S tier. But I got to put him in A tier. What I'm about to say might sound hyperbolic, but if you watch Diego Godin play, I know you know this is true. He has one of the greatest center back peaks I've ever seen in my entire life. And I'm not saying, not in the past 10 years, not of this generation, not in the past 20, 30, 40 years. No, of all time. This guy from 2014 to 2018 was a top three center back in the world every single year. He was that good of a player. That good. His 2014 season is one of the best seasons a center back has ever had. Scoring the goal against Barcelona in the last match week of La Liga to secure Atletico Madrid their first La Liga title and I don't know how fucking long. Scoring the goal in the UCL final that should have been the winner if Sejo Ramos doesn't score his goal later on, obviously in that game in the 93rd minute. We all know that goal. And then he scored the goal to get Uruguay out of the group stages of the World Cup against Italy in Brazil, obviously. This guy was that good. I mean, he could come up with big goals and big moments and defensively so so physical and so aware and also one of the greatest leaders. Every time, like, here's the best compliment I can play. To, uh, here's the best compliment, sorry, I can pay Diego Godin. When MSN was going up against this guy, I feared for MSN. I didn't fear for him. I feared for MSN because I was like, oh my God, they have to go up against this guy and Jose Maria Jimenez and Felipe Luis, obviously in that great Atletico Madrid backline and Juan Fran. But this guy was the leader of that backline. And a lot of times, he made Suarez look a fool, and he made Messi look a fool, and he would, he would make Neymar look a fool, because he was that good of a player. And again, his, his, his leadership is second to none. In 2016, the Atletico Madrid team that made the UCL final, he was a key part to that team as well. Obviously, like their leader, and arguably, their, like not even arguably, a top three player for them. I mean, this guy's a generational talent. He was really good at Villarreal as well before ever coming over to Atletico Madrid. Was amazing at Nacional in Uruguay. Then he obviously went to Inter later on. Wasn't great for Inter, but still he was older. And now he's playing. I think he just retired uh, in the in the league in Uruguay. But Diego Godin, if you watch this guy play, second to none. What a peak this guy had. Never got fucking tired. He never got tired. He was always drenched in sweat, but never got fucking tired. And he'd come up with big goals in the air. So good. His recovery pace was really, really good. Everything you wanted a center back to have, this guy had. And his team of the season card in FIFA 16, one of the best cards I've ever used. So this guy to me is going to go into A tier. Again, I really debated putting him into S tier. If, it was, if this was solely based on peak, on, on peak, he would go into S tier for me. But again, we got to look at peak longevity and also trophies won. And unfortunately, Diego Godin never won a UCL, never won a, never won a World Cup. So the two biggest trophies, he never got his hands on them. He won a La Liga title, which is obviously huge. But again, I can't put him in the S tier with Diego Silva. But if you know, you know. If you know about Diego Godin, you know how good this guy was. Next up, we have Giorgio Chiellini, who to me is going to fall right next to Diego Godin in A tier. Again, similar to Diego Godin, one of the best and most underrated center backs of this generation. I was debating between putting Chiellini, Barzagli, or Bonucci, obviously that Juventus trio. And I was like, which one do I pick? And I think Chiellini to me was the best out of those three. Then I would say Bonucci was second and then Barzagli third. But Bonucci played for a long ass time. bro. This guy joined Juve in 2004 and just left them recently. And he's won basically not everything. I mean, he's, he's, he's never won a UCL and won a Euro recently. That's his biggest trophy that he's won a Euro. And he played in Serie A. I mean, he came into Serie A at a young age. And he was going up against the biggest, the best strikers in the world. He was going up against Shevchenko and Crespo and Slatan and Eto'o. And this guy would hold his own every single time. And like Godin, very good in the air. 
so good in the air. And this guy was a key part to that uh, um, Juventus team that made the UCL final, obviously lost to Barcelona in Berlin in 2015. And obviously that Juve team that made the UCL final in 2017 and lost to Real Madrid. And both of those teams, I mean, mostly 2017, that's one of the best defensive teams I've ever seen. They scored, they conceded four in the final, but that Real Madrid team in 2017 is simply a top five team in the history of this game. I mean, I don't really blame them for that, but they shut down my team. They shut down Barca in the, in the, in the quarterfinals. I mean, thanks a lot because of, like, go back and watch. Go back and watch uh, Chiellini's performance in that quarterfinal against Barcelona. More specifically, the first leg where he scored the third goal from that corner. A goal that I can't even, I don't even know how he fucking scored that shit. He's like, like, it was just, such, he was, he was bodying, I think, Piquet off the ball and just scored it. And they hit the post and, and it went in. But that whole performance, he was pocketing MSN. Pocketing him, Bonucci and Barzagli pocketed that trio, and this guy was obviously the leader of that back line, in my opinion. And then, obviously, later on in his career, actually was able to win a Euro with Italy back in 2021. I think his most memorable moment of that Euro was obviously holding Bukayo Saka back by the collar and tackling him and not getting a red card. But this guy was really good for that Italy team, obviously. And yeah, man, to me, he's one of the best center backs of this generation for sure. I think he's better than Matt Hummels. I think his peak isn't quite as high as Golin's or as Thiago Silva's, but his longevity is 100% there. I mean, this guy played for. A really fucking long time. So for that reason, he's going to go into H-er. But this guy, man, what a player he was. So physically gifted, so strong, and just a fucking workhorse, man. A great player Kalini was. Next up, we have Marquinhos, who to me is going to fall into B-tier. Marquinhos, here's a fun stat. He's only 29 years old. Can you guys believe that? This guy's only 29. I feel like he's been in football my whole life. He joined PSG in 2013. He's only 29 years old. Marquinhos, to me, he was brought in to be the heir apparent to Diego Silva, obviously, at PSG. But I just, I, I don't see it with Marquinhos. I watched this guy play for two years while Messi was at PSG. And yes, he's good on a random Saturday at 1 o'clock against Nantes on a league game in league on. He's great there. But when it came to play the big boys in Europe, this guy always came up short. And there's just, he just, he left me so, like, every time I watch this guy, like, every time I watch Messi play with our PSG team and I watch Marquinhos in the back, he never, like, he never instilled confidence in me as a guy who was rooting for PSG. I'm not sure about how PSG fans feel, if you, if you guys want to let me know in the comment section, if any PSG fans are watching this, but he never instilled that confidence in me to, like, this guy's going to come through. He, I think he scored a goal, actually, against Bayern Munich in the, in the UCL quarterfinals back in 2020, when, obviously, PSG made the semifinal and got knocked out by Bayern Munich. So he scored an important goal for them, but when I watch this guy, I mean, he was part of the, he was so bad in that game against Real Madrid in 2021 when Benzema scored that hat trick. He was so fucking shit. And again, one game doesn't make a career. But again, Thiago Silva at League on was arguably like a not even arguably was a top three center back in the world but he would show up in the big games this guy's playing in league on but never really shows up in the big games whenever i watch him play and to me he, yes he's only 29 he might still enter a new gear in his career because again a lot of players don't hit their prime until they're like 30 31 especially center backs i mean some of them just like later on in their careers when they really do reach their top level and maybe we'll see that from marquinhos later on but to me as it stands right now never really won a significant trophy won a copa america with, with brazil in 2019 but other than that never won a uco made a uco final obviously in 2019 um you know, he's a good leader, but I, do I really watch this guy play? Do I think, oh, this guy, you know, he's going to come through when his team needs the most? Is he a Sergio Ramos leader? Is he a, a, a Thiago Silva leader? To me, no. So for that reason, again, his peak, he's to me right now a top 12 center back on the world. I mean, at his best, I would say his best year was probably that year that PSG made the final and lost to Bayern Munich. You could argue he was top five then, but I mean, to me, he's nowhere near Godin or Chiellini or not even close to his uh, obviously Brazilian teammate Thiago Silva. So for that reason, he's going to go into B tier right next to Mats Hummels. Next up, we have Nico Nicolas Otamendi, World Cup winner, and he to me is unfortunately, even though he won the World Cup, is going to go into B tier. Otamendi, I watched this guy play at Valencia a lot before he made his move to Man City, and he was utterly fantastic, bro. He was so good at Valencia, was one of the most promising center backs in the world. I mean, this guy's, I remember his FIFA 15 team of the season card was so fucking nasty, and then obviously made that big money move to Man City, and obviously City fans can speak to this better than me, but every time I watched this guy play at Man City, he was either really, really good or really, really shit. It, there really wasn't an in-between. He was either amazing or just fucked up every single time and Otamendi to me here's the thing he's a good player I mean his he has he has a lot of great attributes most notably his leadership he's a great leader of that back line he knows how to command his troops uh but I, I just don't know he never gave me that confidence I think for Argentina even in the World Cup in 2018 in 2022 sorry when they when they won and he was he was one to me one of Argentina's best players by far he was a top three player or top five player for Argentina in that World Cup in Qatar in 2022. I mean, was he better than Cuti Romero? I think they were both really, really good. But to me, I would say Otamendi was slightly better than Romero. But even in that World Cup, he's the guy that gave away the penalty to Colomani in like the 83rd minute because he was caught out of position and then had to drag him back. Again, one play doesn't make a whole career. But to me, Otamendi now obviously playing at Benfica. He's been good for Benfica since leaving Man City. But 
But again, his peak is nowhere near the other guys here. His longevity, again, at Man City, he was sometimes riding the bench. Sometimes he would play. And when he would play, he was either really, really good, like outstanding or really, really shit. So for me, it's just too inconsistent throughout his career. Again, I'm happy for him that he won the World Cup. And that's his crowning achievement, that World Cup run with Argentina in 2022. He was fantastic in that whole run, like I mentioned. In the final, had that one slip up. Uh, obviously, giving away the penalty to Colomani. But I feel like, you know, he kind of dealt with Mbappe and that, uh, that France uh, front line, obviously, fairly well. Uh, because Mbappe scored two pens and they only scored one goal from open play, which was just uh, uh, like one of the most amazing goals ever. I mean, that volley is just insane. But yeah, man, to me, Otamendi, his peak is not quite there. His his uh, his longevity is good, but not great. So for that reason, he's going to join Marquinhos and, and uh, Mats Homos in B tier. Next up, we have Sergio Ramos, who to me is going to fall into S tier as a Barca fan. I fucking hated playing against Sergio Ramos. I hated this guy. Every time we played in a Clásico and he would get sent off, I would laugh. I would be so happy. But as a football fan, I cannot deny this guy's greatness. And he, to me, is the best center back that I've ever seen. Like, when it comes to longevity and peak, it's, he's like no one compares to this guy, in my opinion. And again, I'm a rival fan, but I got to pay this guy. His, I got to give him. I got to give this guy his respect. There's this new trend going around on TikTok and some spaces. People talking about football, calling Sergio Ramos a passion merchant. If you believe that, you never watch this guy play. If you think Sergio Ramos is just a passion merchant, you never once watched this man play. He was far from a passion merchant. He's one of the most complete center backs this game has ever seen. He actually started off as a fullback. He won a World Cup as a fullback. He transitioned to center back back in like 2010, 2011. But he started off as a fullback, as a right back, obviously. And then he obviously made a transition to center back. And he was, to me, a better center back than he was a fullback. And this guy won a Euro as a full, as a center back as well in 2012. Won four UCLs as a center back. Or three, was it? No, it was four UCLs as a center back, obviously. And he scored some of the most important goals in the history of his club this guy captain a team that won three straight ucls and after cristiano ronaldo you could argue who's the most important player on those teams this guy was that good single like that 2014 ucl campaign it was ronaldo here and then it was Sergio ramos right here behind him he scored the goal in the final in the 93rd minute he scored a brace against Bayern munich in the first leg he scored another goal in a ucl final in 2016 he injured Mohamed Salah in Kiev, obviously, in 2018, which sucked. But he was really, really good in that game. I mean, he, despite that Conor McGregor move, he was a really, really good in that game. Then he goes to PSG, and he was actually one of the best players on that team, in my opinion. And now he's currently at Sevilla at the tail end of his, at the tail end of his career. But Sergio Ramos, man, I hate waxing poetic about a rival player like this. But you got to pay this guy his respect. I mean, one of the most intelligent players football has ever seen. And to me... The single greatest leader in the history of this game. The single greatest leader in the history of this game. Maybe Pujol is, is a close second, but Sergio Ramos is one of the greatest leaders I've ever, that I've ever seen, along with Messi as well. You could throw in Ronaldo in there as well. But I think Sergio Ramos, when it comes to leadership and rallying his troops, he's second to none. This guy was that good of a player. And again, as a player, I mean, his recovery speed was amazing. His tackling ability was fantastic. His aerial ability was second to none. And he could also play off on the back extremely well. So for me, Sergio Ramos is going to go into Esther again. Like I said, to me, the best center back that I've ever seen. Again, I'm, this is coming from a Barca fan. But this guy, I mean, passion merchant. You don't watch ball if you think that about Sergio Ramos. For sure going to go into Esther. Next up, we have Jerome Boateng. Uh, he, to me, is going to go into A tier. A lot of people debate who's better, Homos or Boateng. I think Boateng was significantly better than Homos at his peak. I mean, there was like a two or three year stretch where this guy was arguably the best center back in football, honestly. From like 2014 all the way up until like 2017. A man who's won every significant trophy in the history of football. I mean, he's won obviously two trebles. He won. He left injured, obviously, in the final in uh, in, Port in Portugal, in, in Lisbon, sorry, in 2020. But he was still obviously a key part of that team. And also won a World Cup. And like Mats Homos, was a key piece of that Germany World Cup winning team. And this guy, he was amazing, but you know what's funny about about Jerome Boateng? He's accomplished so much in his career. He's been he was such a great player in his peak. He will always re be remembered for one moment, and that just goes to show you you can do so many great things in your life, but if you fuck up once, no no one will ever let you live it down. And, Matt, and Jerome Boateng is a prime example of that. Everybody knows this guy because when Messi meme them, everybody. I mean, obviously you might be a Bayern fan and you and you watch this guy play obviously his whole career, but people who aren't Bayern Munich fans, when you say the name Jerome Boateng, it, like the first thing that comes to your mind is not World Cup winner, UCL winner, great center back. It's the time that Messi broke his ankles. One of the greatest memes in the history of football. So again, as a player, very physically gifted, obviously very tall, very strong, great in the air. Um, was rapid as well. I mean, this guy was really, really fast. Despite being such a big man, he was really, really fast. And just a physically imposing player as a leader. Obviously one of the leaders of that Bayern Munich team in 2019 and 2013, obviously. But yeah, to me, his peak is like, it's a really good peak, like up there with Golin and Kelini and his uh, longevity is, is good, but not great. But I think he has, I think he was just a better player than Otamendi, Marquinhos, and Mats Homos. And that's why I'm putting him into A tier above, above those guys. Next up, we have Gerard Piquet, who to me is going to fall into S tier. 
One of the greatest center backs football has ever seen. I'm going to repeat that one more time in case you didn't understand what I said. One of the greatest center backs football has ever seen. It's become a trend like recently to mean Gerard Piquet on social media because obviously he's kind of goofy on Instagram and all that shit and his Kings League stuff. And that's obviously that's fine. But people want to correlate him being goofy on social media to him being a bad player. And that's far from the case. I watched basically every game or I should say 95% of the games Gerard Piquet played from 2008 upwards in his career. Basically 95% about here and there. I don't really miss parts of games like that. And I can tell you this guy is one of the best center backs of all time. Take it from me, a guy who watches Barcelona week in and week out, and most Barcelona fans can attest. And if you're a rival fan, if you watch your RPK play, if you're a La Liga watcher, you know this guy is far from overrated. And this guy was so, so good. In his peak, he, he was a top three center back in the world. It was like between him and Ramos as who's the best center back in the world. He was that good. He's a four-time FIFA Pro 11 player. A four-time FIFA Pro 11 player. A guy who won a World Cup. A guy who won a Euro. A guy who was a key part to multiple UCL winning teams. A guy who who, who, who came to Barcelona as a young kid and was a, was a starting center back in a European Cup final for Barcelona in 09. And then in 2011, once again, and then in 2015, once again, that once the, the one guy that was there for all those UCL finals, obviously when Messi was there, in that back line, was Gerard Piquet. And obviously Dani Alves, what I'm saying, like as a center back, an amazing player, an amazing, amazing player. His ability to play off on the back and his long passing is second to none. I mean, so many times this guy would just play a ball, a ball over the top and was so, so good. And also his defending ability. I mean, as a defender, he was amazing. He could catch up to players. He could make last ditch tackles. He was so intelligent as well. I mean, what an amazing player Jared Piquet was. Don't look at him in his final years at Barcelona when he was kind of washed already. Obviously, we all remember that game against Inter in the UCL in the group stages where he was just utterly fucking terrible. But this guy, in his peak, I'm talking about from like 2009 all the way to 2019, like a 10 year window, was one of the best center backs in the world every single year. He was that good of a player. Next up, we have Pepe. He to me is going to go into B tier. Sejo Ramos is a guy who I hated uh, playing against and I hated him as a Barca fan, but I can respect Sejo Ramos. I can give him his, I can give him his props. And I did. I put him literally in S tier and I said he's one of the best. He's the best center back that I've ever seen. I can't do that with Pepe because to me, he was nowhere near the player Sejo Ramos was. Sejo Ramos was, sorry. And he's also just a shitty person. He's a dirty player and I don't respect dirty players whatsoever. I mean, this guy's more known for being a dirty player than he is for being a great center back. I'm sure he was a great player to speak to me. He was a little bit overrated by Real Madrid fans. They're talking about how he's like, he has one of the greatest peaks ever. I heard some Real Madrid fans say that recently. Pepe has one of the greatest center back peaks of all time. Fucking bullshit. Not even close. I mean, I don't know where you got that shit from. He was a good center back. Obviously, won a couple UCLs, won a Euro with Portugal. So he won some big trophies, but, uh, uh, an overrated player, in my opinion, a dirty player, and I don't respect dirty players. He's more known for being a dirty player than a good center back. So for that reason, not a fan of this guy whatsoever. He's going to go into B tier. Next up, we have Vincent Company. Ah, oh, man. A tier. Yeah, he's got to go into A tier, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, City fans. And I was going to put, I was debating putting Vincent Company S in S tier. But again, I said this in the intro. This list is fucking stacked, bro. I mean, this guys are all, these guys are all so good. Vincent Company joined Man City in 2008. And he was basically the staple of that Man City team that obviously became the most dominant team in England. And you could honestly argue, I'm talking about like after the takeover. I can't talk about Man City players back in the 50s or the 40s because I don't really give a fuck about that. But post takeover, he's City's arguably best ever player. I think I would say Kevin De Bruyne, but you could say Vincent Company second. And Aguero obviously played for them and David Silva played for them. And they've had some great players play at City, but you could argue Vincent Company is their best or second best ever player. He was that good. On the national team, he was decent as well. As a manager, he fucking sucks. But as a player, I mean, this guy, one of the most physically gifted specimens I've ever seen. What a fucking tank this guy is. Honestly, that's the best way to say it. he's a tank. He's a fucking tank. I mean, so tall and so, like, he has these broad shoulders too, bro. I mean, this guy, I'm salivating just thinking about it. I'm fucking kidding. I'm sorry about that. How was that? That was that Stephen A. Smith meme that I saw recently. Well, anyway, moving past that. I mean, this guy physically has a great frame to be a center back. He was great in the air, was really, really, like, one of the best leaders, honestly, in the history of football, in my opinion. I mean, this guy, the way he could rally his troops as well. I've said that about a lot of guys here, but honestly, that's the job of being a center back. How well can you rally the troops? And Vince Company did that as well as anybody. And also, he could score important goals. I mean, that goal that he scored against City back in the 2018, 2019 season that basically won Man City the league. I mean, this guy came up with that out of nowhere. No one ever saw Vincent Company do that shit. And he just scored a fucking banger from like 30 yards out. I mean, a great player, a big game player as well. Unfortunately, he never got to, he, unfortunately, he never got to win the UCL with City. Uh, never won a big trophy with Belgium either. His trophy cabinet is a little bit lacking. That's why I can't really put him in S with the other guys up top because as you can see, Ramos, World Cup winner, Euro winner, uh, UCL multiple time winner. Pique, also the same as Ramos. And obviously, Thiago Silva actually won a UCL company never won a UCL uh, but I mean he was still a really really a really really good player a staple and arguably like I said the best part on that Man City team for basically over a decade uh, but to me again his peak is one of the best I've seen his longevity is there as well 
but I'm saving the last pattern, uh, the last spot, sorry, on S tier for a guy that we're gonna see very shortly here, and I'm sure you can guess who that is. Next up, we have Virgil Van Dyke, and this might cause some people to be upset, and I get that. But he's gonna he's gonna take up the last spot in S tier for me. Those are my four guys in S tier: Sergio Ramos, Thiago Silva, Virgil Van Dyke, and Gerard Piquet. Virgil Van Dyke, I get his longevity isn't really there with the other guys here. He joined his first big team in 2018. Before that, he was playing for Southampton and Celtic. Okay, I get that. But his peak is better than every other guy in S tier, and it's better than every other player here. It's the greatest center back peak. It's better than Beckenbauer's, by the way. It is the greatest center back peak in the history of football, and no one can convince me otherwise. I'll say it once, I'll say it a thousand times. Rojo Van Dyke has been the best center back in the world for the past six years. Since he joined Liverpool, he's been the best center back in the world every single year, apart from the year that he got injured, obviously, in the COVID season. But other than that, he was he's been amazing. He's been, I, he had kind of a down year last year as well, but I mean, he's, he's been consistent, like, uh, that's the outlier. He's been consistently great for a long time now, and this year, he's, to me, the best center back in the world. But his peak, 2019, I mean, let's not forget, this man finished four votes, or I think it was five votes, off winning a fucking Ballon d'Or against not just any player, not a kind of auto Ballon d'Or where he won it, but who else was really in contention? This man finished five votes off winning a Ballon d'Or against prime fucking Messi, the greatest player we've ever seen, Messi in 2019. That's how good Messi was amazing that year. Obviously, if you watched him play, you know that. And Virgil Van Dyke was about to win the Ballon d'Or over him. And even if he if he would have won it, even me as a Messi fan, I wouldn't have been mad about it because this guy, the performances that he put forth were insane, bro. Like in the UCL, every single game, man of the match in the final. Like he was amazing in the semifinal in the four 0 He was great in every single game. And that Premier League campaign was fantastic. I mean, this guy. And as a player, what doesn't he do well? He's six foot five. He's fucking like he's massive, bro. He's a he's a huge man. Pause. He's sick, like he's he's ginormous, obviously. Pause one more time. He's extremely rapid. He can read the game better than anybody. He's a great leader, one of the best leaders in the history of the Premier League and in the history of football, honestly. He's great in the air. He's great like playing out from the back. What is what does he not excel at? Really, what does he not what does he not excel at? Like with Piquet, he's not really that fast. With Thiago Silva, his height kind of, like, he's not great in the air because he's, he's not as tall. With Sergio Ramos, he's great in the air, but he's also not quite as tall. And he's also kind of a hothead. He just got, let, he lets his emotions get the better of him. What does Virgil van Dijk not have? He has the speed. He has the height. He has the physicality. He has the aerial ability. He has everything you want a center back to have. So for me, no question about it. He's going to go into S tier 100%. To me, the best peak from a center back. I've ever seen. Next up, we have Rafael Varane, who to me is going to go into A tier. He was, I was debating putting Van Dyke or Varane in S tier, but I went with, with Van Dyke because I think his peak is better. But Varane was amazing. I mean, this guy was uh, a key piece of France World Cup winning team, a key piece to a Real Madrid team that obviously won multiple UCLs. And he was, along with Sergio Ramos, you could argue they're the best center back tandem of the last 15, 20 years. I think the best center back tandem ever is Nesta and Maldini, obviously, but th these guys are right behind them, right on their right on their tail because they were both that good. But Varane specifically, I mean, this guy was so, so good. Again, similar to Virgil van Dijk, very few things uh, Varane can't do. He was extremely, like he had great, he got great speed. He was a great tackler, was very physical. Not the best in the air when it came to like scoring goals and stuff like that, but he was like, obviously he's tall, so he could, he could, he, he, he needs, when he needs to clear a ball with his head, he could do it as well. A really, really good player and kind of just like underrated in my opinion. I think I think people forget about how good Rafael Varane was in his prime for both club and country. Like I said, a World Cup winner and a multiple time UCL winner. His peak was great. His longevity obviously is now at Man United. It hasn't been great for him, but he's still been one of the most consistent performers, honestly. Performers, honestly. Every time every time Varane plays, he's been decent for Man United in my opinion. Far from a problem on that team. Um, but yeah, to me, he's going to go into H tier again. It was between him and Virgil van Dijk. I think van Dijk's peak is so much greater, in my opinion, that it just kind of puts him on to, uh, above. But Varane, he's going to go at the top of H-tier for me because I rate this guy very highly. And yeah, just a great player. But unfortunately, not good enough to go into s in my opinion. And lastly, we have John Stones, who to me is going to go... I don't know. I think John Stones, for me, is going to fall into B-tier. I just don't think... When I think about John Stones, he's been a key part of that city team. Obviously, there's won multiple Premier Leagues. Obviously, joined from Everton back in 2016. Was amazing last year for that trouble-winning team, playing as a CDM, basically. Such a versatile player and so good at playing out from the back. He's so good on the ball. One of the best center backs in the history of this game on the ball. But to me... He's just not on the same tier as company and Kilini and Golin and Baran and, and, and Boateng. Maybe in a few years, maybe like give it like two or three more years where he, sustain, where he sustains this high level and he's been great for this long. Maybe I can put him there, but his, but his peak to me is more in line with the other guys here, not with the guys on A tier. And also his longevity 
It's just not quite there for me. But again, I rate Jones Stones very highly. Give it a few more years and he might find his one to A tier. Maybe sometime. Maybe what, by the time he retires, he might be S tier. Who knows? If I make this tier list in the next 15, 20 years, maybe I'll put Jones Stones in S tier. But for now, I get it. It might be controversial, but it's going to be into B tier. And also, I want to keep this tier list a little bit more balanced. So I wanted to put them there just because of that as well. And that, guys, is the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it, man. Pretty balanced tier list. Like I said, I mean, we have four in S tier, like I promised. We have uh, five in A tier and five in B tier. So, I mean, you guys say, complain and say I put everybody in S tier because I didn't today. I was critical. I said what I have to say and I gave these guys their flowers and obviously I hope you guys enjoyed it. I love every single one of you, man. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace out.